Hi, everyone. This is the Bipolar Awakenings podcast with me, Sean Blackwell. And today, my guests are Michelle Mellis and Pedro Orego, creators of the film Drunk on Too Much Life, a story about their daughter, Karina's struggle with her non-ordinary state experiences. The film is terrific, and part of the reason is that Michelle and Pedro are both award-winning professionals in the field. Michelle is an American-Canadian director, writer, and producer who's worked with some of the top broadcasters in Canada, and she's also produced a number of short films as well. Pedro is a Chilean-Canadian story editor, producer, and musician who's worked on documentaries for broadcast and festivals for over two decades. Having seen the film, I think it's a must-watch for anyone interested in seeking alternatives to the current mainstream understanding of mental disorders. Okay, so Michelle and Pedro, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. Thank you pleasure, for having us. It's such a pleasure. Okay, so I saw the movie, uh, Drunk on Too Much Life, and I thought it was terrific, uh, really creative, really nice, tight editing, and a nice story to tell. And so I just wanted to get give you guys an opportunity to share your story about you know, why you decided to make this film. And I'll just turn it over to you. Sure. Uh, yeah, so basically we started this film, actually when Karina first, uh, for those who haven't seen the film, our daughter had, uh, she was really worried about my husband's uh, health and uh, he kept coughing and, and we were kind of worried, but I thought, ah, oh, he's fine, you know, he's a young man. Uh, he bike rides every day and then um, she was in our family kitchen and she started seeing like basically these kind of dark spirits coming out of his body and uh, two dark spirits and uh, so you, you can tell the rest of the story but yeah I mean but the same what when Michelle um, yeah we, when she's right where she left off and we we're just going back a little bit so, um, so Karina had been hospitalized and, and was in the hospital at the time when, when this happened. And she was just here for the, uh, to her house for the weekend. Um, and she'd been hospitalized because she was sort of like in, a, in, a, in an altered state or what do you want to call it, a more extreme state, where she was seeing mm -hmm. visions and things. And so when she came into the, our, our house, um, she, yeah, she said that she, she saw these two shadows and, and, uh, and then... I was, I didn't know what she was talking about and, and I was trying to distract her. She just was very insistent. I see two shadows and and then and, and what's going on. And then she went back to the hospital and about a couple of, it wasn't even that long. It was about a week and a or week and a half later, I uh, got diagnosed with lung cancer and there was like two tumors in my lung. And so I think that was one of the reasons why we, we kind of thought, Okay, there's more to this yeah. <laughs> situation we, we than, we, thinking, than we than we think than people talk right. about, um, and so we started making a film, and it was mostly a way of learning and and maybe even changing our perception of the stuff that gets called like bipolar and 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 you know madness in general. Like we wanted to explore these ideas and and think about the way that the that we were kind of had this feeling that the way it's dealt with in our culture is very limited and limiting like it's not it doesn't let the individual grow it's sort of um it you know puts the individual in a sort of category and yeah it's get... like the scientific language it's like it becomes oh she has psychosis we were told by doctors you know she's in psychosis the longer she's in psychosis the worse it is so we right away you're terrified so, and the only way to bring them out of psychosis is by drugs and a multiple drugs different kinds of drugs and uh, so we were terrified as parents, but then we started to think, well, no, like this idea of psychosis, like they make you feel like it's eating away at your brain. Like, mm -hmm. they, they literally, they, they were, you. they scare, they scare you. Right. And, um, so we, we just started to think that the, the way they explain these, such, these kind of conditions is, is way too reductionistic it's like based on kind of the only the so-called problematic brain chemistry which has been proven to be wrong and uh we're not saying that these experiences are painful and what Karina did was struggle but it's just we found the scientific language around these experiences were was a bit too reductionistic for a full explanation of what Karina was going through okay and let me get a bit of a timeline yeah. on this whole thing so you made the film in 2017 was it started 
Yeah. yeah. Started, like we, we started, yeah. Did we started the film. I mean, we, we, it was a, the film went through a few iterations and what, and, you know, we didn't know exactly what the film was going to be. We just started feeling like we needed to document what we were going through as a very, it, you know, it's, that's the other thing is like, as a, as a, as a parent, we're filmmakers. As, a, as parents, we kind of thought we, we were sort of very taken aback. More, I mean, that's really putting it lightly. Yeah. We, we were very much like, you know, like very like in pain, in pain, and then sort of overwhelmed by what was happening. Um, and that's not to say that and Karina was really struggling, obviously more than we were. And so it was a way of just trying to to sort out and deal with what we were what we were what we were going through and 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 somehow the camera uh makes um it's an it's a, it's it's like a way a of opening therapeutic, doors yeah it's, it's a therapeutic device i think it's like like i thought the film was like and we both thought the film was a form of narrative therapy in its own way or in 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 documentary language you would say domestic ethnography like it was like we took our own lives and we we're like let's let's open things up and use the camera as not only kind of a therapeutic device, but also a, as a way to explore this issue of like, what hap how do you understand mental illness when the biomedical model doesn't doesn't work? Yeah, but it was mm -hmm. it was pretty much like I like we we didn't even think about it too much. It would just pick up the camera. It was like, like sort yeah, of it's like an art form. And but then but then it just started evolving. So to answer, you, sorry, there's a long, very long yeah. way of answering. <laughs> we started in two thousand fourteen. And then we it, we, did, we, we kept it, shooting yeah till the uh, till twenty one twenty one yeah yeah and I finished it for my master's so yeah okay it, and when did the uh, film launch you might say go public yeah in twenty one it it launched 21. right after we finished oh, right. we had a first festival right away yeah, yeah. Wow. wow with within the yeah. university or uh, I decided not the university because uh, you know the festival scene is really weird but. Uh, so I, we launched at the Rendezvous with Madness Festival, which is the largest okay. mental health festival in the world. It's and a the really oldest. good one. I would really recommend so, people look into it. It's amazing. Yeah. It was like we decided we wanted to, instead of going through like the dock, like uh, hot docks or TIFF or not that, you know, we'd have yeah, we <laughs> maybe, yeah. but like we did, we, we decided to Rendezvous with Madness because we wanted to reach clinicians and students and people. We, our aim with the film is to open minds and uh, to really make change in the way we perceive these things. Mm -hmm. And it's, I gotta say, you guys are pretty original because usually with parents, the one and only response is just panic, do what the psychiatrists say and that's it. But then you guys are like, well, hang on. This is really kind of interesting, and actually, maybe we should start filming this whole thing because it's kind well, of fascinating material, you know. And devastated at the same time, it's not an easy space to hold, you know, psychologically. I mean, we, we did panic. That, that's the thing is, we did, we did. Like when, 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 when the first time it happened, um, it was very extreme, um, and uh, you know, you I mean, mean Karina's first crisis? Well, yeah. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, man, exactly. Like so, so it's yeah. like. And what year was that? Before we get into the story, no worries. 2014. 2014. Yeah. And 2014. So you had three years with this before you started to film. That's right. Yeah. And then, then that was those were the panic years because basically, okay. Um, yeah, because it was very extreme. Like she, she went into it as first a, almost like a catatonic state, but also in complete um, suffering so so deeply. Like she thought that the world was going to end. She was the cause of the world ending. She was seeing demons and it was it was really really bad and we didn't know how to deal with it if she was gonna eventually come out of it i mean it, it was because it was so extreme i was like this is gonna be her reality from now on and that's what it felt like and so we did panic and we did do what the doctors say and we and she did go on medication all that stuff happened um but then i mean the the, the big thing that happened with us is um the drugs weren't really working i mean they 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 made they made it like the side effects were horrible as we all we all know but even even besides that um she was still going into into extreme yeah. states it wasn't episode really... after like they call it rapid cycling mm -hmm. bipolar disorder basically it was like oh okay she's rapid, rapid cycler. Cycling, all right. bipolar one so it was like this constant cycle and we were just like, how do we, how do we find healing as a family? God, we have to, the doctors didn't, you know, the doctors were struggling too. Like doctors 
we thought that they'd come far, much farther in advance than they had. Like they, yeah. were, they were using yeah, stuff it's... in the 1960s. I'm like, what? No, not even. I mean, they were, they were basically, I like, there's actually my, in, in the film, my sister talks about this moment where we, we were surrounded by dogs and we, and we were like, okay, well, the dogs are going to tell us what to do. And it was basically, they were looking to us, like, you know, so what What do you guys think? So do you think she's the friend? Like, I understand that we know her More. the best. I get it. But then even then it was like sort of like, well, we could try this or this and this doesn't always work. And then let's try her on this. And it would be like trials of two weeks. And where Queen, I was walk, walking around like, you know, Zombies, completely like a, yeah, like a, and stiff. And she could barely move. Parkinson's, could barely talk. you know. And then, and then yeah. oh, there, another drug. Oh, you know, this one made her completely lethargic to the point where she was uh, drooling and what all this kind of stuff and then it was like no 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 oh this one kind of sort of works right so that yeah. kind of like you know we had no idea that it was like this sort of like you know well, throw, throw the dart at the dart you know and, throw and, the dart the, the dartboard thing they're just guessing they're always just guessing right that, sorry the right. promise was that drugs were going to cure her almost like so with the, we were so like it was like the information was not cure but it was like Oh no, the only pathway through this is drugs. So then we were like, what? Right. That's you the know? other thing. I'm sorry, just to, it, when, when, I know we're talking about it. One of the things is like, we asked the doctor, he, she's in this state, is there any other way of getting her out at all? And she, and she said, no, medication, that's it. And uh, psychosis is bad for the brain. So here's your choice, yeah. right? So that's literally what it was. And she was a young doctor. She was a smart doctor. She was a, probably a good doctor but that was just the line that was the line right um and so we 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 completely right we went right into it and it was it felt like trial and error and it was we weren't getting anywhere i mean you know? there were times where you were recommending drugs like and they yeah. were like yeah okay <laughs> no, I'm no, not it, was, it was even worse than that it was like they said they said well here's the thing we're, we can try to either of two drugs we're going to try one and you observe her and with and along with the nurses, of course, but you know, you know, you're her father. And then we're gonna try another one. So I had to like make like kind of go like, I don't know, it's such responsibility for somebody to kind of go, that's the one. And you know what? It turns out I was wrong. Yeah, because you did, it was horrible. And then there's yeah. so much responsibility because so long story that's short, is we're saying that the drugs they only work if the person is doing some work to understand their experiences they like well not only but for, for us i mean there's there's probably yeah. something some there's you know some people yeah, that some take people. you know whatever like they take one thing and then it's like that's it they even out perfect like good for you guys but it didn't happen with us like you know at all who initiated the sort of seeking for alternative approaches was it a joint decision was it you guys i think you know there was it was complicated but like at one point, the psychiatrist at the hospital, because we had such a reductionistic view of everything at that point, the drugs, drugs, that's the only thing. And at one point I, I started, I lost my faith and that's in the film too. It was like, they basically, I asked the doctor, you mean personality itself is just biochemistry? And he's like, yeah, just per personality itself is just chemistry of the brain. And so I was just, I had a complete crisis. It was like, oh my God, I lost my, it was like, oh my God fucking consciousness itself and I, I just was like everything became like a material reality and uh yeah i had to reevaluate that way of thinking we just had a crisis in terms of even like what is consciousness like it was like oh all of a sudden it just came about your brain <laughs> but you know I, I should answer your question a bit like i mean not that you yeah. i'm just saying uh to add to that um Actually, the the film, the, in a way, picking up the camera was a way of looking for alternatives. Like, yeah. and that's because, for example, there, there's a there's a, a man that's quite prominent in the film called uh, Kevin Healy, and he right. had this event called Mad X, which is like, which is really quite beautiful. It's like he basically has this kind of open stage where people can just come and be themselves, and so this sounded really great to me. But we we took the camera and we and we, and we were we went with the intent, like probably if I'd gone with Greena. I probably wouldn't have thought, maybe I would have said hi to Kevin, but but I probably would have moved on. But the camera, I, he was interested in being interviewed because he's actually there's a chat there's a chapter of of uh, the uh, Hearing Voices Movement tomorrow, which is basically him. So so he okay. was interested in, in sort of talking to us, and we were interested in talking to him. And then that led, and he was a wealth of information in this world. Like he introduced us to Sasha De who's in the film. He introduced okay. us to kind of like. Other, other, Will other, Hall, other, even, Will yeah. Hall, Will other, Hall, other, okay. people, other ways of approaching this stuff. 
he was, uh, you know, we, we were so thankful to him. And then we also knew of Gabor Mate. So, but it was like the film sort of in a weird way initiated that search. It was like, it was like a catalyst in a yeah. really strange way. Yeah, because sure. we didn't know. We were just like, this is, something's not right. <laughs> like, yeah. let, let's, where do we yeah, go? where do we go? And, do we do? and so, like, you know, a lot of mental health activists and people are madness act activists. They're at a different level than us. Like, we were coming at it from, like, psych wards. And where do we go mm -hmm. from that experience? Like, it was like, that's what, that's what we're we given in part our of culture. The community. I mean, that's the thing about is like the alternative sort of mental, whatever you want to call it, like the, 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 the recovery movement, all these different, uh, just all these different uh, scenes, you have to find them. And, yeah. and, and they're not, they're not, they're not so Easy, out there. Yeah. And they're, they, you know, you, you, you can start researching and, but it's really word of mouth. It's really sort of like, um, at least that was our experience like we weren't yeah. like it wasn't just like somebody in the hospital had pamphlets like yeah you can also do this that, actually the peer support workers in the hospital told me about the Icarus project before oh, but but, nice. but then I, I didn't quite follow up you know but then kevin mm -hmm. introduced yeah. us to the Icarus like project. you have to be ready for it too and i think it's as parents you're just you don't know who to believe you're just like okay well this is the reality it's a medical complete medical condition and the only way to get her out is drugs. Like, so that's what you kind of believe. That's what's mm -hmm. given in our culture. That's, that's what we do. But, but Michelle, it sounds like you had, before you encountered this psychiatric culture, very materialist, sounds like you had more of a mind, body, spirit orientation to life previously. Yeah, yeah my dad uh, introduced me to Artie Lang when I was, like, he was a total uh, artist and philosophy guy and you know I grew up like very bohemian and you know very, with this kind of background but when Karina went into crisis right you know it's like you don't think of those no things. I mean just... same, same with me I mean my, my my siblings were like my my brother's nickname in Chile is Mr. Hippie because he is a hippie like a full-on <laughs> hippie and then my Mr. sister hippie. and he's a great 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 person super brilliant but but so I had like you know like so I had this kind of like, kind of a counterculture kind of view of madness as well, where it's like, you know, a sage might be a bit mad or, you know, like this kind of sense of just like creativity and, and like, you know, Dolly and Picasso and Captain Beefheart Bando. and just like all these people that are just like out there where I felt them. So I, but once it starts happening to your child, you're like, okay, this is a bit intense, right? <laughs> Especially right. when she's one years old, just getting her life together. And then it's like she's talking to demons and talking about to angels and you're like okay you know that's yeah. interesting but it's also super intense and and how, well, how do we deal with that how do because especially she then say felt overwhelming to to her and to us you know yeah and like the, the the thing is and this is in the film too is like the only avenues are the hospital the home or the streets like there is nothing in between which is horrible like because really what she needed is a runaway house like a soteria house or again these are things that we learned later on but we have nothing like that in canada and mm -hmm. in the you, United States you had a in, in the film though you visited a few places and one center in particular that seemed to have quite a strong alternative perspective yeah, I mean, yes. they, tell me about what a little bit more about that center yeah, yeah. So, so that center was started by also another mother who was struggling uh, to find a holistic a, view, a holistic uh, approach to her daughter's health. They had gone three years, or it was Stella's place. It's called Stella's place, and her Stella's daughter's name is Stella. Okay. And uh, so she went to the United States. They went to the United States for three years to try to find an answer and nothing. And so she just started Stella's place, which is this community center where people who with lived experience go. It's run by peers. The peers hire even the psychiatrists. They have art programs. They have wellness programs they have like em employment and it's about giving autonomy to the to the individual and Karina loved it it was like the only place in Toronto that that she could uh go and and my view is that those kind of community centers should be in every neighborhood in the city like we should be having those we don't there's we need a community center that middle way between yeah. the hospital and it's beautiful it's and, and it's like place. and this is private like, so here we are in Canada with a socially funded medical system. Uh, and that's the answer. We should be like, you know, CAMH is 
is great, but it's 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 this monolithic institution in the middle of Toronto when we should be having all of these kind of little places around in every neighborhood, really, for for young people who are struggling. And by the way, do you know who funds that? So Salas Place is, is, is all like uh, fundraising and grants and, pe- you know, private people who give money to them. And oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. So it's all private. I mean, that's the need, right? Like that's people mm-hmm. do have a need for it. Like it's, it's sort of, uh, it speaks to the need. It speaks to the need that, that people do give, like we, you know, we, we give money to yeah, them. Yeah, we give money. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, there's big donors. They have a film festival now that um, there's donors that give to it. So, and she did a lot of probably, I think she was involved in all sorts of like grant. I don't know. It's complicated, but it's basically <laughs> not through the government. In other words, okay. so, it's not through the government and people are not paying to go there. It's being funded. No, no it's no, all no, free. No, no, no. Anybody, grants in this country. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not age 16 to 29. Yeah. yeah. When we first started the interview, we talked about a little bit about Karina detecting a tumor that you had or, or a twin tumor in yeah. your lungs. Yes. Yeah. And so that was a strong, like unequivocal psychic reading for you. That you know, absolutely. For her. Yeah. yeah because, because that makes with the fact that she was completely obsessed with my health, like to the point where she would go buy me lunch every day and they was, would cry about my health and stuff like that. So there was, she was sort of, uh, uh, to me uh, and to us and then to Karina herself, she was perceiving something that had to do with my state. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, it's interesting because I feel like it sounds far fetched and whatever and kind of strange, but I really felt it. Like I really felt it the moment I got diagnosed. I was like, "Wow, that's that's that was Karina was feeling this." But Karina had an insight about this. Yeah, and, yeah. and things like that happen. Like, yeah, and then and even it like because because I did this film for my masters, I had to research academics, so it's grounded in academics as well, academic research. And there's these two scientists at Yale that are studying the connection. And I'm like, oh, good. It's a Ivy League school, too. The connections between psychic, uh, like kind of hearing voices and psychic beha- behavior and psychosis, because there's a spectrum. And mm-hmm. one of the key lines in the film is uh, Joseph Campbell, who said, you know, the psychotic drowns in the water uh, that the mystic swims in with delight. And so we were like, well, it is the same water. So what is it? We, our goal as parents was to help Karina swim in this water. Yeah, sure. But it is, yeah. it is, it is, you know, I thought that was a very profound uh, line. Yeah. And, and we were reading a lot of Young, too. And Young talks about, you know, synchronicities. And, and, and he saw visions, like he had that vision when he was oh, uh, yeah. on a train and he saw this, these rivers of blood. And it turns out a year later, or even like months later, it turned out to be, that's the site of where these battles happened in world war one yeah yeah he had, he had things like that happened to him in as fact well. that after that vision is when jung left uh psychiatry and went and dove into doing the red book which was a 14 year dive into psychosis and the unconscious mind and so in a beautiful book I mean, yeah in a beautiful book. Yeah. I, I mean mm-hmm. i think that there's you know karina calls it catching fish in the net you know sometimes you catch fish in the net and, and sometimes it's just garbage that you're catching because sometimes <laughs> you catch fish in the net so your own garbage like your own you know your, <laughs> yeah, own, your psych- own garbage your own, your own psychic garbage. garbage but sometimes i mean you know like when i was um when i was a younger man uh much younger um i i, I, I had a friend who's uh you know who's a uh, like his pagan is his but his uh tribe or his people which is it's basically the what people call the blackfoot and um she had, he was following a medicine woman and, and she was incredibly powerful and she was, she saw things all the time. And, and, you know, in other cultures, that's just the way it is, you know, yeah. and, and for us, we cut ourselves off and that's, you know, and that's unfortunate because I think we're missing out and we, and we kind of, kind of go, oh, that's just a coincidence. It's like, well, you know, like, like I was when some that the experience we all have, I'm getting this from Genesis Porridge. I saw him in an interview with this guy, Genesis Porridge, and he says, you know, like, we all have that feeling of like, I was just thinking about you and you called me. We have, we all have those experiences where you kind of go, oh, whatever. But it's like, no, that's, that's There's actually something, something yeah. there. That's, we don't, we kind of shut ourselves off from. And, you know, to be honest, that was part of the part of the movie that I was a little excited about. We don't develop it in the movie as like, let's explore the psychic abilities of, but we, 
we wanted to put a little touch of that because I think that's something our culture does not want to be open minded about. It's sort of like, you know, when, when you talk like we're talking now, people are kind of like, oh, woo, oh, yeah. woo, oh, oh my God. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, really? Yeah. <laughs> is that, yeah, what, is that like, where we're at? That's like, where we're at. Like we're talking about like people all over the world have, have like shamans and, and mystical things and mystical rites and stuff like that. But we can't go there because why? Because we have science? Like, come on. No. Yeah. It's and and I think, I think you know, the, we've learned it too, this, like the scientific paradigm and we're not, my sister's a scientist and we're not against it. We're just saying, come on, that's, this is, this is a story. It's like, you know, this is a, one of the stories that we tell ourselves and we can see that it, we can put on that lens and see the world in that way. But there are other stories to describe all experiences right but we're only told we're told the scientific lens is the only lens and this is how you should see reality and this is the only way to see reality and we just found that like nah we don't we don't really agree with that it, like it's not the only story to explain the world i mean and it's also so fucking western centric like talk like pedro said talk to indigenous people like Oh, we're just going to say their whole life experience, all their experiences are just, no, sorry. <laughs> no, we've got the only, you know. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, and not that we, well, like we've developed that, you know, it's not like we're shamans or mystics or anything, but, but I just felt like that was sometimes you come across experience, across experiences like that you can't explain. And I think we've all, we all probably have stories, right? Like where you kind of go, that was unusual. That was strange. That was a coincidence that's hard to explain, you know. Things like that happen to all of us, I think. And and living in Brazil, um, visions and voices are a regular part of Christian spiritism, religion, and channeling African gods and all this kind of thing. So most people have family members or friends who are involved in um, channeling spirits or, or getting messages um, down cool. here. It's all within a religious context, you know. Um, and they had a guy named uh, Chico Xavier down here. Um, I think the heart of his work was in the 70s. And he was an automatic writer. And he wrote 300 books just wow. straight from spirit. And he became like this huge celebrity in Brazil. You know, and I've got goosebumps talking about him right now. You know, wow. and, uh, yeah. And, and you'll find this interesting, I think, because you've seen the scientific side of things. They took a lot of these spiritist channelers who do the automatic writing. They took them to Germany to test them. And what they tested for was brain activity while they were writing. Hmm. And the, the channelers said that they were, when they were writing the spiritist, when they were channeling the spirits in writing, that their brains were not working, that they were, they had, they didn't think much. They just, it just came out of their arm. Okay. So. Oh. The scientists said, okay, well, let's test that. Let's test the brain activity of these people while they're automatic, doing the automatic writing. And that's what they found. They found that their brain activity actually reduced when they were doing the automatic writing. And the experienced writers uh, had their brain activity reduced more than the novices. So it's sort of something that you literally need to get out of the way for the right. spirit to take over. Now, the research didn't prove that they were channeling spirits, but it did prove that what was happening was what they said was happening. Right. And that right. was pretty, pretty cool, right? Oh, that's yeah. impressive. I mean, our film touches on uh, this idea of like hearing voices and depending on the context, like unfortunately some of Karina's voices were really negative sometimes. And part of that is because our society doesn't doesn't cultivate these or doesn't even accept these kind of things the only references we have for hearing voices are are is horror films yeah. and, mm -hmm. and they're demonic and so i'm sorry karina is so sensitive that you're 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 kind of absorbing some of the cultural messages and so what people in the hearing voices movement say is that if we if you live in a culture that is celebrates or, or kind of at least accepts hearing voices their voices wouldn't be so, they wouldn't be so angry or some, some, not, not all voices, but some yeah. voices wouldn't be angry. Well, yeah. And that's the other thing is that in the film, we kind of touch on the hearing voices movement. Actually, there's like in the, in the DVD, there's a companion film that gets yes. further into the deeper uh, hearing voices movement, but it's a, it's a huge 
movement, not so much in North America, but in like in, in Holland and in England and sure. in other parts of the world. It's quite big. And mm -hmm. these are people who live with this experience and do not identify as necessarily mad or or don't uh, don't live on the with a diagnosis who just hear voices on a regular basis and accept them and they're either guides or just voices like we live with a with a kevin healy and i don't want to speak for him because he's, he has his own way of talking about his voice mm -hmm. but he has he lives with many voices and he has this main voice called dave who um sort of he has accepted and part of his life and he says Dave is kicks his ass you know like really keeps him going and and <laughs> that things to him and he can either accept them or not but it's this voice that's always there and part of me envies that ability <laughs> or whatever that gift mm -hmm. you know good like, you never know you know so I mean they're not nice. necessarily they're not necessarily destructive you know they're not, not exactly. if if you just have a culture that sort of supports that thing about hearing voices you know and when I when I go into non ordinary states for my work with holotropic breath work and things like that, I'll get voices. You know, they'll come through when I'm in those states. And when I work with clients, I can't really tell the difference between what they're telling me, like their interaction with their voices and the voices that come to me when I'm in an non ordinary state. I can't tell the difference, to be honest. Except mm -hmm. except that sometimes those voices really push people to do destructive things in certain yes. situations. So you've got to be careful, right. you know. Yeah. Careful. And Kevin talks about like how to understand your voices and what they're saying, the, the dark ones too, like, and what do mm -hmm. are coming from bullies. bullies, you know, like for example, Karina, we found out that she was really extensively bullied that came out in the, the, the sit down session with Gabor Mate on camera. And uh, also Pedro and I had gone through a hard time in our marriage and that, all like Karina absorbed all of this and she, so some of her the some of uh we had a feeling that this was happening anyway but some of that that kind of so-called psychosis was this there was trauma coming out in a way like it was like although it's more complicated it's more complicated that. but definitely that's yeah the, the voices that are negative and that are telling you things are often the voices of people and saying the exact words that those people said right. to you and they come up as if they're externalized and you just hear them and they're scary, you know, and, and they they, they can be, they can, they can really, you know, affect your life. But, but, you know, like according to Kevin, again, we've learned so much from Kevin says he uses those voices and he listens to what they're saying. And he, he takes, he takes knowledge from what they're saying and he, and he learns what they're saying. And once you kind of accept them, they become smaller and they, they get quieter and, you know, so it's actually yeah. deal with it. Well, like it's his thing mm -hmm. is deal with them, understand them. Yeah, yeah. And, and and this is what I, I had a podcast with, from uh, with Robin Timmers of the Hearing Voices Movement in the Netherlands. And Oof. yeah, he's a guy who was on the streets, homeless. But then someone taught him from the Hearing Voices Movement how to relate to these voices and interact with them. And then, you know, it, it, it goes into a much more digestible place, you might say. Yeah. yeah. And and they've got messages. They're important what's being said. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, Kevin has told me that certain situations the voices have actually helped them. Like, you know, like there's been situations where the voices say, Get out right now or something like that where you're like, boom, you know. You know, and it's so I guess we all have those internal voices sometimes, but what when they're external, you you know, you you hear them loud and clear. It's yeah. it might be yeah. helpful. <laughs> great, great. And another therapy you brought up, uh, I think you brought it up briefly in the film, but uh, was it inter-family systems, internal family yeah. systems? Yeah, Sasha De Brule, uh brought that up and he, because at that time Karina was supposed to interview Sasha, but she was in the hospital. Uh, she had to go to the hospital. And so Sasha was talking, and at that time she was struggling with her, her like feeling really bad and worthlessness. And so Sasha was saying, you know, there, the, he practices internal family systems therapy, which is kind of like what's called parts therapy in some ways that we all have these multiple parts of ourselves, but essentially there's this core self that is good. And, and, and it's like, it's centered, you know, when, but these other, some of these other parts take over and he, he, he said, it's kind of like driving up, like who's driving the bus. Like sometimes these freaked out kid parts are driving the bus and they're reckless and out of control and so you want to get back to that centered self right but these 
in my experience, what I think of as uh, these parts is the, they're kind of manifestations from our childhood or whatever it is, and they develop. Like, so for example, in my case, uh, last year, I was really struggling with the, the voice of the, uh, kind of like an inner critic. It was like this constant criticism, like the voice, like, can't, you're not good enough. You're not this, you're fat, you're ugly, you're old. This is constant. Everywhere I looked, it was like the critic was taking over. And then Kevin mm -hmm. gave me this book called Embracing Your Inner Critic, where it kind of explained where that voice comes from or that part of you. And by understanding it, it kind of went away. So sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes understanding something and delving into it, it disappears if right, it's a negative. Right, right. Yeah. And with the internal family systems, I know that they've got uh, certain subpersonalities that are like protectors. And, right. And yeah. And one thing I found really interesting in, in learning about it was that they um, very often when you go to a psychologist and you don't want to open up. Well, well, therapists will often think, well, the client was defensive, you know, and that's like looked at like a negative thing. You're being defensive. You want to open up. But in family, internal family systems, they recognize that, um, oh, no, that's that's a subpersonality that's protecting the person pr from feeling yeah. certain things. And so that protector needs to be heard. You that's know? right. That's what I heard. Yeah. That's because the inner critic develops because essentially it's trying to protect you. Like I was like this very daydreamy kind of kid. The mm. inner, inner critic is kind of like, oh, if you don't stop now, you're going to get hit by a car, get your, shit together, get your yeah. shit together, get your shit, you know, you have to survive in the world. It's not easy to survive in the world. Like, you know, fucking, you better put on a, you have to be tougher because yeah. you're going right. to not make it. You're going to be on the street. It's what I did, it's funny because Gabor in the film, Gabor Mate, um, screen that we we didn't actually put in the film because we have so much cover but one of the things that he did do is he, he he kind of pointed out that you know like when that when you hear that voice that's that's kind of being so negative you have to kind of say to that thank you i understand yeah. you're trying to help me and thank you for doing this job but i think i'm okay right now and then, and then that the voice does literally just kind of ooh, interesting it's almost yeah. like the job like, like the job of that voice like you said is to to protect, protect you. you it's like to actually protect make you, you feel yeah centered but it's going way overboard you know but then it also for me anyway it incorporated elements from my mom you know it's like that that there was like she demanded a high level of perfection so it's mm -hmm. like that so you kind of it, it's not quite as simple as that it kind of can morph it cannot oh, yeah. it's, it's it's you know it's like that's what we found was like like with this whole film too is like how complicated it is when you're dealing with you know, so-called mental illness and psychology and your history, your own, all your narratives and your, the way you were up, brought up, it all comes together in this really crazy potpourri of, of, of things. And so it's not easy to just say, oh, it's just this, you know, it's just, yeah, some mm -hmm. of it's like a biochem, some of it's based in your genetics, just some of it, but then all the, <laughs> there's all this other stuff. So it's very complicated. We want to simplify mm -hmm. things in our culture, right? And I and I'm I'm still waiting for someone to show me the test that shows their genetic problem. I haven't seen one of those yet. I, well, I I'm so sorry, but show me the test and I'll say, okay, but until now I haven't met anybody who's had a test, MRI, PET scan, or anything. They can't find anything yet, you know. And they've been looking yeah. for a century. You know, I yeah. don't think they're gonna find anything. No, I have no. been asking, I asked doctors so much because they made us feel that that there was something wrong with her brain from the very beginning. That's how they make you feel. So I'm like, let's give her a scan. Can we fucking give her a scan? We still haven't got a scan because like they, I don't think they're scared. They're like, no, there's, they're like, they're not, they're, it's not going to show anything. And I'm like, but you're telling me yeah. there's something wrong here. Right? Uh, it's really no, a kind of religious mindset, psychiatry, that, you know, it's scientism and we can explain, we know what we're doing. I was at a conference in Latvia, Riga, Latvia, and the, and it was a psychiatric nursing conference and the the lead speaker said we know what we're doing yeah. and i thought that was just like the most insecure thing i've ever heard any professional say about <laughs> anything in any field <laughs> it was like they are really nervous they are so insecure cuz they they know they you know that. you have to say yeah. that did you imagine the cat it's like fix my car that's yeah. different this I know what I'm doing. I'm going to take my car to another mechanic. I'm like, no, you don't. You don't know what you're doing. If you have to say that, you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. 
Uh, well, we we have found that psychiatry is changing. In fact, a lot of the psychiatrists that Karina has seen at CAMH are much more open-minded and they're younger and they're just much more aware of the limitations and they're honest about it. They're like, you know what, this med's going to do this, but like, they're just honest about things. And so much so that one of the psychiatrists, lead psychiatrists who ended up being, who was Karina's psychiatrist at one point, published an article in the Global Mail saying, woke psychiatrists shouldn't forget the biological roots of mental illness. And he talked about these psychiatrists, these new psychiatrists that are walking around in their Chelsea boots and they you know, <laughs> about the social, social determinants of health, you know, kind of thing. And um, I got into a very public debate in the con comment section with another woman who is in Canada, who's completely only on the biomedical side. And we got into a very public debate in the comment section, but I thought it was very funny that this is Karina's psychiatrist. And there's a, there's a sense like, don't, you know, we're medical doctors. We have to remember this is about. Yeah. And like you were saying, they, they don't, they really don't want to kind of open up the, the gates to other stuff. They, they just want to like, we are in control. And it's sort of like, yeah. why not? And like, you know, go open up, like think like to have people like, you know, you offer resources, other types of things. And like, it's like, we're all in, you know, it's not your domain. It's not like, I think it's like you said, it's like insecurity. Cause it's like, you know, when I go to, to my doctor for my, for cancer and the oncologist, I go to the oncologist because it's like, yeah. I know she's, she's, she's going to give me the best possible treatment, but it's like with, with your mind, with your spirit, whatever you want to call it, this whole complex mix of things that it's, that's us. It's like to have one person for that job, like, you know, that's just. That's, that's, and that, that was another right. thing that I just quickly, I wanted to say is that when Pedro got a treatment from Princess Margaret Hospital, which is one of the top hospitals in the world for cancer treatment, he had a whole team of, of doctors working with him. Like we're talking a nutritionist, a ther a psychiatrist that talked to him. I'm like, what? Your psychiatrist talks to you for like an yeah. hour. And she was like brown educated, like really cool psychiatrist. And <laughs> they had a team. And I was like, when, where is that treat? Where is that approach to mental health? We don't have that. It's not like a team based approach at all. Like at the hospital, the, the, the food was like most of the kids were vegetarian and uh, they were giving the wor worst food you can possibly imagine. I mean, on the other hand, mm -hmm. the, you know, the cancer is such a big thing. They have so, yeah, much, so much money, money, so many resources. It comes out of money. It's, it's, yeah, because it's like, and, and, and it affects, like, it, it's sort of like so clear, like we were saying, it's clear. It's like, you have a tumor. Okay, let's deal with that. Mental health stuff is just so, what is it? What's going on? Mm -hmm. Like, let's categorize it. Yes. Oh, no, wait. Like, the number of diagnoses Karina has been given uh, is, yeah. is incredible. incredible, incredible. Like almost everyone. And every time she goes in the hospital, she get, comes out with a and new diagnosis. And it's like, okay, so now we have this collection. <laughs> what do we do with this collection? Like, what, what do we do? Like, it's like, you know, it's like, I, I don't understand what the approach is. It's like classifying, mm. classifying, classifying certain drugs, but maybe not, you know, it's just sort of like. Yeah, she's been diagnosed with basically everything. And like she's bipolar, a bipolar, schizoaffective, and schizophrenia, all three? No, not schizophrenia, but she's been a okay. OCD, borderline, you okay. know, depression, anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, uh, ADHD. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just almost like, come on, are you serious? Yeah. Like, like, stop. And it's like, just stop. Yeah. And it depends on the visit. Sometimes yeah. it's like, oh, this is it. She's like, it's like, because Karina is like the most sensitive human, right? And that's the other thing is like, I was actually listening right before before this uh, in interview, um, while well, I was listening to an interview with Sasha De Brule, there's, uh, there's another podcast, mm -hmm. and he was talking about sensitivities, that basically it's like sensitivities at the core of this, like some of us are just born sensitive. And then, yeah. and then he says, like, you know, you can, it's complex, and some people think it's this and this and that, but it comes down to this person's sensitivity. And Karina's like this completely open person. And it's mm -hmm. like, it's, it's, it's a particular quality. And even that, I mean, even, even that's mysterious. What is that? What is sensitivity? It's sort of like this openness, this kind of like you get, you get affected by stuff. It's almost like you're missing um, some protection of that a lot of us have, but at the same time, you are, you benefit, there's a gift in, uh, yeah, involved a, as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've told, it's, I've told some clients, I, I see it like, imagine you're a Ferrari on a planet of dirt roads. 
Now, right. Ferrari is an amazing car, but this is a planet for Jeeps, you know? And, right. and I think that people with disorders, the, se the sensitivity they have is a little bit like that. It's like, it's a gift, but in a rough, in, a, in an emotionally stunted culture, like, yeah. which is, I think we've got, it doesn't yeah. go so well. Exactly. No. It's yeah. a, it's a produce, yeah. produce, no, produce. Like, go, it, it goes hand in hand with capitalism. Yeah. Like, it's like, you have to be a productive citizen. Right. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Go, 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 go. What do you do? Yeah. What do you do? Like, yeah, exactly. What do you do? Who are you? Who, are you? Yeah, who, who are you is what do you do? Like, you, who are exactly. you? Like, what, like you're, that's your career. Like, so you know, that's the thing is, so Karina and so many artists, my father's an artist, like, like I'm surrounded by, we're surrounded by artists. Artists are sensitive and they struggle with their mental health. Like, I don't know, mm -hmm. most artists I know struggle a bit. The good uh, ones, yeah. yeah, the good ones. <laughs> no, and, and like, they've got, they've got research on that too, that shows that people of our artistic sensibility have a higher propensity for disorders. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, how could mm -hmm. you not, cause our, our culture, it's like Galvar says is toxic. So if you're sensitive, mm -hmm. you're, you're absorbing that toxicity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you were a in a different that. culture where we had a healthy environment and supported artists and thinkers and dreamers, would they necessarily struggle as much? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I'm pers my own personal opinion. I don't even know if that culture has ever existed right. the way it could, but I think we're intuiting that a better culture for this kind of thing could be around for sure, you know? And, and yeah. I've seen in, in my own work, um, most of the people that reach out to me have an artistic background of some kind, you know, exactly. musicians, actors, dancers, uh -huh. this kind of thing. That was a big part of the film too, is that we had to explore this artistic connection between, you know, so-called madness and, and creativity, because that was another thing that was being squashed in our culture. I had to do this film, like I, I said, for my doc, my master's. And so I had to analyze documentary and how it approached mental health. And we noticed that like there's great documentaries like Crumb and all these great documentaries <laughs> at the turn of the century where they accepted. Do you want to explain it. Crumb for a second? You know, I'm a big Crumb, uh, Crumb fan, but you might want to explain it's on a Robert few things. Crumb, this famous Robert comic, Crumb. Uh, comic book artist. And there's a lot of documentaries at the turn of the 90s and early 2000s that should talk the, about yeah but the crumb no but the crumb one is fascinating because it's actually it's uh, it's um it's three it actually is following three brothers i mean crumb is like the most famous brother and the most right. uh, yeah. sort of culturally known and and uh most like really really talented artist very controversial for good reason but he's just like a, he's like this open book and then a lot of what's in there is not very nice but but uh but, but he's, a, he's a fascinating guy. I'm a big fan as well. Mm. I've and, seen the and, documentary. It was terrific. It's like it deals with this idea of just like this traumatic upbringing and the way it's manifest in these three brothers. Right. It was beautifully done. And there was no mention. What my point was that there was no mention of like, oh, there should be, they should be taking medicine. There was a switch in our culture, though, with devil, the Daniel, Devil and Daniel Johnson. All of a sudden, there's you start to see in film where it was like, oh, he's just he needs to be on his meds. There was a complete mm -hmm. switch in our culture. The, with the beginning of neoliberalism in our culture around the two, 2008, 2007, it was, we started to see, see this complete shift where no longer were we celebrating just the mad artist that was just, you know, it was where we didn't think of the, the medication angle. All of a sudden it became, oh, these guys need to be med medicated. Yeah. Where are you talking about that coming up in the culture? In, in like in film? Yeah, in documentary film, you you see. Mm. So, for example, we saw this incredible documentary, which I recommend. What was it called again? Uh, Mag about Maggie. And, Jupiter's wife. Yeah, Jupiter's wife, and it was Jupiter's I really wife. recommend it. Jupiter's wife, and it's about this girl, woman who hears voices, and she lives in New York in in Central, Central Park. Park. No house, like just no homeless. house, homeless. Yeah. And this guy follows her, and he starts to see that her so-called voice her voices and her delusions so-called are they completely make sense when you start to look at her life yeah it's all metaphors mm. for things that had happened yeah to her. for things that had happened to and, her and things that had affected her and, and she lived in this realm where she was dealing with these things but they all have to relate to this realm as well they all relate to this realm as well mm. yeah and then it would i can send you that part of my essay but it was like if you, you start to see this shift, where, for example, with the devil and Daniel Johnson, 
they didn't even introduce, this is another famous artist that had, uh, I guess, bipolar schizo schizoaffective disorder, so called, and they didn't even interview him. So the whole thing was about where, you know, how incredible Daniel Johnson is, but he needed to be on his meds. But, but you know. it, just a little aside, like just the idea of art being, saving people is, it's very clear in Karina's case, like in, in, in the film, you see it where she was so, de so depressed, so horribly, horribly depressed. So she felt hopeless and just poetry and doing, right. doing a visual art and singing a lot of singing um, brought her out, like in, in, a, in a certain way, mm. gave, gave her a way to express this inexpressible thing. Um, and, and like the poetry or poetry at that time is incredible because it's like, it's sort of juxtapositions of images that don't quite core. I mean, uh, kind of don't quite make sense in, in a way, but you kind of feel them. Like, and, and she was feeling music so deeply and, and there's like, um, so art can be an incredibly, not only do, does it people create art, but also they can be save you when you're in a bad state. They can connect you to something that's deeper and more, mm. yeah. I don't know, like mm. just a, like go to a deeper, deeper part of yourself. Yeah. Do you, do you and, know how Car Karina feels about the film? She, she loved the film, but she's, she kind of wants it to be our baby because she wants her own. She yeah. felt we, she, she, she was open. She wanted to film what with us for many years, but then she kind of got sick of it. And it was like, and I get it. And she's like, you take, I don't want to like, it's. She, she, she loves the film. She, she's like, so we're like, we were worried because actually there was a moment when she, when, when, it, when it, the film became too much and she said, I, I'm not interested. And then, but then, but then she, the way we stopped, obviously. Yeah. And then Michelle, when she got her, her, her uh, degree, um, which she made the film. Um, she asked Karina, and Karina said, "Okay, but we'll have to see it first. And then, and then we were like, we were like kind of worried. But then we showed it to her, and she loved it. But like, but Michelle said, she and she's happy to talk about it. But Michelle's like Michelle said, like she, she feels like that's that's enough. Like yeah. <laughs> that's enough. She doesn't want to go. No chapter two. Nothing else. Like she doesn't, she doesn't want to be." that person she's in a the poster state. child for the whole thing yeah. Yeah. She wants to move on yeah. with her life and so yeah. we're like okay well in a way we also we made the film together but we also made it with a bit of a social justice angle where we were like this we need to make change you know and, and we she, were very careful about yeah. not getting too personal with karina like you never get a sense of her love life or blah, 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 her personal life or okay. anything yeah. like that because it's not about that it's not it's not about it's about like she didn't feel comfortable kind of talking about certain things that we were like, yes, absolutely. So we made it more about how the search, the search and then the idea of just like, this is what happened to me and then the way I want to tell it. Like, you know, Karina and Michelle says, Well, how would you tell your story in the beginning of the film? Because it's like it's not about us telling the story, it's about what do you feel comfortable talking sharing? What do you where do you, what part of the search do you want to share with people? It's not where it's not like this movie where it's like necessarily where it's like this is the totality of what happened and there was some there's you know there's 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 a lot that we most of the stuff that happened that we didn't put it but we just want to get this we be personal and be like come from a really good place but not like not like put Karina in a position where she feels like she has to share stuff she's not comfortable sharing it, it was very important for us to have a high sense of ethics because right. so nobody in the film was uh, was shot. We didn't film anybody that wasn't in a good state. If Kevin wasn't in a good state, if Karina wasn't in a good state, because for us it was really important to be ethical because we were putting this out into the world. Sure. And sometimes documentary can be really unethical. It can be a, like a sort of a, a freak show, and that's not hard to yeah. do. That, that's kind of like, like I think maybe the film might have even gone further if we had gone like. You know, here's like here's <laughs> okay. like. Is how bad it gets, right? And you're like, well, uh, we have to. We don't have to show that. What's the point of that? That's not the. That's not the. That's the person not in a place where they, like, it's sort of like us seeing it from the outside. We don't know what's going on the inside. We we have no sense of that. We're just seeing this, this this spectacle of this like person not being well. But it's like, why? You know, <laughs> I don't want to mm, be shown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's like filming somebody unwell. Why would you do that? <laughs> And it's such an obvious question, but it just never gets answered, which is like, 
well, they look terrible on the outside, but what's going on on the inside? Nope. What is driving all of this? Nobody seeks to ask, you know. That's right. But it's, it's changing, like you said. No, it, I do see that it's, it is changing. I, I mean, I'm hopeful slowly. it is slowly, but the younger psychiatrists and the younger doctors do seem and the peer support movement and the peer support movement. And movement and... Right, right. Do you have any advice for parents out there from your you know experience? What would you tell parents now if if they have a a son or daughter that goes into acute psychosis and boom, all of a sudden you're thrown into this world of, of psychiatry that you've never encountered before? Good mm -hmm. question. Good question. Like, uh, well, the first, I guess the first thing is like, let's deal with the crisis. Like for us, we really had to uh, take care of our own health. Like uh, I think parents are, uh, I mean, the good parents in a way are like, you just, you just are willing to sacrifice everything. And the first thing is to, to just make sure that you are well, that you have a good sense of you, because you're not going to be able to do anything. So you can't think rationally. You're not able to research. You're not able to do anything unless you're well. So that's the first thing. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's a really good point because I feel like, you know, as a parent, as parents and as family members, even it's really hard to separate. Like sometimes, uh, um, you know, I've heard people say, and I've heard podcasts about this, that it's sometimes it's easier to help strangers than it is somebody to help your family because you're so invested. You feel their pain so strongly. You sometimes impose your pain on them because you're in so much pain. So it's, it is a very complicated, complicated situation. Um, and the, the other thing just quickly is like, if you know about, like, we didn't know anything about the hearing voices movement. Uh, so for example, a friend of mine's daughter started hearing voices and she went to Kevin's workshop with her daughter. And uh, at the same time, she was, because she knew a little bit more than me. I didn't know anything about this. She also took her daughter to the sleep clinic. Mm. The sleep was, is huge and important. With those two things, her daughter's completely fine. Like she's worked through, it yeah. was just, just, so she avoided the psychiatric system. Yeah. completely mm -hmm. just with sleep and learning about her voices but but also wow. if you do get a psychiatric system like don't i would say don't be scared like they're, they're gonna maybe try to scare you don't be scared and like really and be an advocate for your child and if you feel like not comfortable with stuff and if the child feels not comfortable with stuff like you have to almost become a bit of an advocate because it it be it, and, and and we notice that the parents who are there fighting for their like there's a lot of kids that are sort of like parents yeah. sort of like do not have anything to do with them. They're so freaked out. I'm not judging necessarily those parents at all because it's like, mm -hmm. I understand, but it's like they, the, the, the kids are sort of in the system and then those kids, uh, you know, it's, it's hard. Like, it's like, cause you have to keep asking for stuff and you have to kind of like, you know, like the, you have to be an advocate advocate and be careful uh, with what they're, Saying and doing, you know, and like I really think about that research stuff. Like Michelle was doing a lot yeah. of research. Yeah, you have to research and look around and just start to think about what are other ways. What are alternatives? Of he like that, healing. I mean, what, well. my our regrets sometimes is like kind of like well, I wish we'd looked into other stuff sooner. But uh, I also don't blame parents like us or like we're in the system because it's like, like like we were saying, they don't. Nobody kind of um, points you in the right direction. But like if you if you were like if there's like yeah, like Michelle said, if there's like hearing voices groups that there's like even like places like Stella's place places where you can if you can peer research support that. workers like reach out to a peer like right away peer support worker excellent like we didn't know even about a peer mm -hmm. support mm -hmm. like did Karina ever have manic episode yes was it more just voices yeah okay it was both no, it was both it was like okay. deep deep depression and she'll she's fine with us saying this because it's like deep deep depression and very 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 elevated to the point but but with but with uh bipolar one so-called it's it's sort of like it's there's psychotic features so it goes into sure. it's not just like mania like oh you know i feel like at the end of like i'm i can do anything i can write an opera i'm gonna write an opera it's more just like you kind of go further and you get into this state where everything just becomes this you know a little separated from reality <laughs> Our I mean, reality. Sasha Sproul talks about it. She, he was diagnosed with the same thing, like bipolar one, and he, you know, he was, he was, he was on the streetcar tracks, sorry, on the subway tracks in New York City, right? Thinking the world was mm -hmm. going to end. Everything was being televised on TV, and all those things come up a lot, right? Where it's like sort of like the world's going to end. I'm responsible for the world ending, or I can stop the world ending, stuff like that, because it feels like your identity is sort of dissolving and 
It feels sure. like the world's ending, I would imagine. Yeah. You know? I was kind of lucky in mine because I just thought I died. And so then if you think you're dead, you don't have any of these saving the world responsibilities. You're going to another dimension. <laughs> so right. it, it manages to keep you out of different kinds of trouble if you think you're dead. <laughs> right. Kind of, although I got naked, so that got me in trouble. But oh. I didn't go out anywhere. You know, I, just, <laughs> I just got shipped out of a hotel ballroom naked. That's kind of how it went. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Part of you. Yeah. I guess yeah. Naked. Okay, and um, website for people to find yeah. you guys. So the film is on uh, drunk. Sorry, you can find more information about the film on drunkontoomuchlife.com, and it's available on Canopy. Which, if you have a uh, library card, it's Canopy is around the world. It's a streaming platform, and okay. it's available for educational licensing on New Day Films. And it's going to be broadcast here in in Canada on TVO and the Knowledge Network. So on TVO, uh, it'll be broadcast on March 14th at 9 p.m. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, so it's, and then I'll put it on my Vimeo site eventually. All right. For for the Americans there, I think TVO is a little bit like PBS, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. PBS. Yeah. Kind but of. Canopy, you can get all over the States. Yeah, Canopy, Canopy you get all over the it's States. A great, great thing. I love it. I watch it all the time. Yeah. It's really good. Good. Great to hear the movie's really getting out there. And um, I'm sure it'll continue to grow. You know, more people will hear about this film. Hope and, so. and by the way, I, I loved your website too. I thought, you know, super clean, very creative, you know. Yeah, Alice Priestley, she's one of my good friends. and She's a Waldorf kid. Oh. <laughs> Steiner. Rudolf she's Steiner. A, yeah, yeah, Rudolf Steiner kid. So yeah. she she's like very creative. So she's did that website. Mm, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, Michelle so and Pedro, awesome. very okay. nice to talk to you guys. Uh, awesome. st stay on the call for a second. We're okay. going to have a little private thing. But this has been really great. I hope people get a lot out of your experience, you know, going through the, the trenches and then filming the whole thing into this amazing movie. I think you're going to help a lot of people. So thank you so awesome. much. Thank you. A lot of, um, I don't know, kudos. It's like, I know what it takes to get out there and, and just bust your ass and not make a dime for years on something. Right? You know, yeah. Nice. That's right. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm kind of there with you. There. Uh, no, just we got other movie ideas. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So thanks again and uh, good luck. Okay. Thank you. Stay in the film. Yeah.